When you sign on to direct a TV show, how much prep time are you given? Contractually, I think they have to give me the script 24 hours before shooting starts. So that's not a lot, really. And it has to do with that with the fact that I am not expected to have creative input into development and into the script at all. I'm being hired to direct what's on the page. I would say in, 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 in real terms how that plays out, I usually have about a week, I would say. And that's when I, because I'm coming from the screenwriting background, so I have opinions on the script for better or for worse, and whether I'm right or not is a different thing. But I have the feeling I'm kind of failing this, this episode if I'm not voicing my suggestions, which I'll, I'll just write up, send to the showrunner, and whatever of that they want to incorporate, great. Whatever they don't want to incorporate, great too. I, that's the, the only time I ever suggest that in the writing stage, because then I have the feeling I've done my work. I've contributed my filter as, as the audience reading it fresh, basically, which I think is important for them to know, because they hired me as a director, so to hear about my filter and my feelings and my maybe red flags where I feel like this or that will be hard to bring out the way that I think they want it. I'd say that once. Um, and whatever they reject, I know that they've already worked on it so long and so many people had to give their okay to green light it that I can't come in and change everything. But that ship has sailed, you know. And that was something that took some getting used to doing TV at first. Um, and then I go in the time that I have, depending on how much time I, I have to sit with it, I'm going through every single scene and I have this kind of questionnaire of 36 questions that I asked myself for every scene. So that because, because when I first did it, I didn't have it written down. It was kind of a whatever question I could think of that I would, would consider with the scene I did. And so much time was wasted on remembering the questions that at some point I was like, if I just, and I have like a simplified one for TV with I think 17 questions or something. And now I just kind of tick them off, boom, 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 answer them. And to me, the great thing is that with some questions, if you force yourself to answer them, like there would be something like, in, in what way does the lighting inform the mood and the scene? Whose, whose scene is it? Uh, it? Through whose eyes do we see things? What is the one takeaway that the audience has to understand in terms of information? Um, what is the one visual image that I want them to carry away? Blah, 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 all those things. And some, some questions don't seem to apply at all at first. And if you force yourself to still think of an answer, they are always the most fruitful ones because you suddenly realize, oh, it applies big time. Like one, one question would be, for example, if you run completely out of time, how do you cover the scene in the shortest amount of time? And just knowing that, that I have that in my back pocket, gives me a lot of security on set because I know if all our, there's this saying, it's, I'll butcher that saying, as you always say, um, it's Citizen Kane in the morning and it's the Duke of Hazards in the afternoon <laughs> or something, which is so true. Like you come in the morning, you have all, oh, we do this and this. And then at the end of the day, it's just like somehow get the stuff in camera that we have that scene. So when that kicks in, I want to be prepared for that. I don't hope for that to happen, but I want to be prepared for it. Or if you wanted to shoot the entire scene in one take, how would you do that? Or which, how do you want to shoot the scene? And if you were forced to do it another way, what would you do? And just by forcing yourself into, oh, that would, be, would have been my go-to way of shooting this. Those are the images that come to mind in the very beginning, instinctively. But if I force myself to put a pin in that and come up with an alternative way for whatever reason, there is, the more resistance I have to that, the more interesting stuff comes out of the answer to this question. That's all a very long-winded say, the way of, of saying preparing for that stuff. But I, I'll do that with the um, with the scenes that seem the most important. And then the way I structure it, which has served me well, is that I don't start preparing scenes with scene one and then go through, but I start preparing scenes depending, prioritizing them by which scene needs the most answers in terms of 
physical stuff because I know that as soon as I come wherever we're shooting, the prop master will answer, want answers, the production designer wants answers. Everybody who has to make something materialize needs some time, needs some prep time to do that, right? So if there's a scene that has, let's say there is the book of the dead, the magical book of the dead, right? It would be, I, I know that the second that prop master comes up to me, the clock is ticking for him or her to get me the best possible version of this book of the dead. So every day that I go like, oh, I haven't thought about that, give me a day, the quality of that book will be reduced and put that person under more stress. Whereas if I can immediately give them an answer and go like, this is how I picture that, boom, 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 they have more time to work on it, I get the better result, right? So in the beginning, when I first was preparing episodes, I was kind of preparing the most uh, character intensive ones first because they felt the most important storytelling wise but that was exactly the wrong way to go because the character stuff is stuff that doesn't have a physical component to it that has to materialize. I can still rehearse with the actors pretty short notice. They don't need to know a week in advance that I'm looking for a certain character moment. That is pretty, it seems important in the story but in the physical um, nature of the overall thing it's not. And then I just write, knowing that other people need time to think about stuff too, I write down the questions that I want to answer, that, that I want to ask certain departments and that I want to ask, first of all, the showrunner. Because I don't want to work for a week and then I have the meeting with the showrunner and I realize that they have a completely different approach to or a different look or whatever, whatever, whatever. So I need my basic, com basic answers to know what our playing field is to realize this episode. Now, of course, I've watched the ideally all the episodes that are leading up to my episode so that I understand the, the language of the show and the look of the show um, and all that. I, the, the one case where I wasn't able to do it was my Fear the Walking Dead episode where I had, it was very short notice and I had watched the first season but then didn't watch all the episodes leading up to mine. But I was like, I'll get away with it. They will, the actors won't know. And they immediately knew. Like there were, there were one or two conversations and they immediately know you haven't watched the last because you are asking me to do stuff that I have done last episode. And you know, So I'll never pretend again. I'll just say, I'm sorry, I didn't watch the last episode. So, but if I can obviously watch the whole build up to it, which in reality, obviously you only get so far until you hit episodes that haven't, that are not out yet. So then you try to get the scripts for those episodes, read the scripts. You try, if you can, get the rough cut, which sometimes already exists off the episode before yours. Like the more information you can get about the lead up into your show, I think the better. Um, and then I always try to meet every actor one on one um, because you have so little time to build a rapport with actors in TV. Um, that even if you have 10 minutes with them by yourself, they are forced to form a relationship with you. Whereas if you do that with three people in the room, sometimes the producer wants to be there and I'm always saying, don't, don't take this personally, but I'd rather do it on my own. You know, because a group dynamic is something that will happen quickly enough, but on set you do need the relationship with each actor on a, on a private level as much as possible. That was a very long answer. What if you only have 24 hours to prepare all of that prep work, watching episodes, reading scripts, all of that stuff sounds wonderful. But if you're given it 24 hours in advance, that's got to be really scary because now you've got to choose what's most important that I do. Right. I've never had it in real life, luckily, that I had only 24 hours, but that is the DGA mandated minimum. I think my, my shortest was uh, one week. I mean, you then cut corners. You watch on, on YouTube, you watch the recap for the episodes, the two minutes thing, what happened now. You read the Wikipedia episode entries that tell you what happened in, so that you at least have the story arc down. You watch the pilot for sure. You maybe watch if there's any behind the scenes footage where the producers are talking, that's worth watching on YouTube because you get a feel for what kind of people they are. And then going through the script, you would probably reduce your your character stuff to what does the character want in this scene 
where are they starting out, where are they ending up, what's their want. Because um, it feels like that is the minimum of what you need to know going into a scene, working with an actor, their, their, their want, that every person in this scene has an objective, what is that? And if you have that, then you can probably walk in, especially with TV where everybody has played their characters for a while and knows their character better than you do, you're probably okay walking into that. Um, yeah, and in terms of the, the, the physical stuff, it's, it is probably worth trying to communicate with the departments already. Don't wait until the producers introduce you to the prop master because that might be days and days and days later. But try to be like proactively write an email to the production and say, can I have the email address of the costume designer, of the, of the prop master? Email them directly and tell them what you want. You know, start a conversation with them because every minute counts in the end. Everything is so stressful that if you can get a head start by a day or two, it makes everything much, much easier, much more doable. 36 questions that you have, do you, you literally have them typed out? Yeah. That's yeah. great. I've done less and less now. I would say maybe I'm doing 20 now or something <laughs> because you just get, it takes a while. Like for a movie, I would still do that. If I know I have one year before I'm shooting, I would still do 36 questions for, and I would storyboard every scene. Because I always have the feeling if I've, the, the main goal of this whole, of the questionnaire is to force yourself to spend 10 minutes inside of that scene, whichever way. Just be there with the scene, think of nothing else other than this scene, so that when you do it on set, it feels like territory that you've stood in once before. That's not the first time I'm now thinking about it, but it's like, and that's why I'm storyboarding stuff. I can storyboard it all, it looks terrible, no one can decipher my storyboards, doesn't matter, that's not what it's about, and I'm not gonna shoot the storyboards. It's just a method to force myself to intensely think about the scene for a second um, and you always come up with something. It's not that, I think Nick Cave said that, that about his muse and whatever, he said that the only job that he has is to show up at nine o'clock in the morning and sit at the piano and don't leave until four o'clock in the afternoon. That's the only pressure he feels, that's his entire job and whatever happens in that time happens. And with this preparation process, I have that feeling. If, if the, at first you go like, oh, I'm not going to come up with anything. And every scene looks banal. It's two people walking down the street. There is no subtext. What am I even doing here? But two minutes later, just sitting there, you go like, oh my God, this is a metaphor for his walk to the gallows. And if I shoot it from here, you know, just through sheer, I guess, boredom or something to sit with it, you always come up with something interesting. And in TV or ev everywhere, maybe, I always have the feeling if I find one thing that interests me about the, the scene, one thing that where I get up in the morning and go like, oh, today I want to do that. I'm looking forward to that. I have to find that in the scene where they are walking down the street somehow. And you always find it, you know. And that one interesting thing always also, or most of the time, informs the one direction that you give your team. Because the last thing that a team wants, obviously, is for you to do a big speech 15 minutes long in the morning about how you see the scene, how the scene reminds you of your mother, blah, 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 blah. If the, but if you can give one direction where it's like, let us treat this letter that the character has put on the table as if it's nuclear waste. That's how I want it shot. That's how I want every blah, 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 blah. It's the as if thing. It's an actress said that to me once. I asked her, what is she looking for in a, in a direction? And she said, um, a code word, a key basically, to open up whatever that opens up, which to me like changed everything because it was before, because before that I was that person who would kind of give these big speeches that I had thought out before, blah, blah, help no one because no one can process all that stuff. But since I know that, that unlocking key thing, um, that's really what it is because now everybody can make their decisions in, in connection with this one thing that I put out there and it changes everything. It changes everybody's approach to the scene and suddenly a scene is not generic anymore because that is the big problem. Fincher, I think, said that it's not, directing is not about what all you do, it's about what you not do and that's how you define style, which is true. It's so intimidating to think here's a scene and you could shoot it whichever way, from wherever, which, with whatever lens, bum, 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 bum. 
how do you make decisions? And I think that a lot of directors or beginning directors get completely lost in that and go like, I, I don't know. So if you find one thing that you base it on, it anchors everything and it informs most of your answers. Some things it won't have any effect on, but whether I put the camera here with the letter in the foreground or over here without the letter, suddenly there will be an answer to it because I know that this letter is important and I want to treat it like a dangerous nuclear waste artifact. So I shoot it differently. So this, I think this one as if thing, I would, if I only had 24 hours, I would try to find that for every scene, find the want of each character. It would be a stressful 24 hours to do that, but that would kind of be the minimum preparation that you probably would want to do. And when you talked about the fear of the blank page with screenwriting, it sounds like there's a similar thing with storyboarding. Yeah, right. Oh, see, now you are there. So there would be such a thing as director's block, which would be exactly that. You can do anything. So what do you do that's the same as the blank page? I'm, I've just invented this story, uh, this bedtime story book, because I can't tell bedtime stories. If you said, tell me a story, I, is, there's, there's a prince, I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I just talked to a friend yesterday and he said what he does is he uh, is asking their child for three words and then he will tell a story. So if the child says toilet bowl, tiger and bracelet, then he suddenly out of infinite options of what to tell has zeroed in on three things that he will now connect to something and make work somehow, which to me was genius, which was what I was trying to do with that book and much more complicated. He really distilled it down to something very simple. But I think it's the same, it's the same with finding that one, the approach um, to the scene. And there's all, all this language around it that is so intimidating and scary where people are like, oh, I want to hear your vision. And the production designer goes, what's, what's your vision for this? And secretly you go like, I don't have a vision. But you can't say, I don't have a vision. But I think that's important not to be intimidated by, but they just want that one word, the key to how are they supposed to approach this thing. And if you just give them one, then it's like this place has to feel really lived in or he hasn't you know, tidied up in two weeks. It opens a whole different door for them and their department, you know, or you want, if you talk to the cinematographer, you really want to feel the presence of his dead parents by the shadows on the wall. Though. In, to the cinematographer, it immediately means, aha, uh -huh, so we have to, we need light sources that are low so that the shadows are being thrown up on the wall. So now the cinematographer has to talk to production design to get those lamps and motivate those. It's a whole chain of events, but you have now given them the direction that they can work inside of their department and with other departments without your constant input. And then you just have to, tr you have to trust that you're working with good people that know what they're doing, where you don't have to micromanage where exactly that lamp has to stand, but you know what the effect is that you're going for. And the effect you're going for is, and that goes full circle to what we talked about earlier, going back to what do you want the audience to experience? You know, it helps if you know, do you want the audience to feel comfortable in the space of the protagonist? Or do you want it to feel spooky? Or do you want it to feel sterile? Or do you blah, blah, blah? Because it means something else for every department. But once you figure out that one word, comfortable or sterile or blah, 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 everybody knows what to do with it. But before you give them that one code word, they don't know which direction to work into. With TV, it's a little bit different again, because that world has already been established and they already know the vocabulary of the world and they kind of already know those answers. But if you are doing a movie, where that world only has to be you know, created, that's where that is vital. I know from just doing background work like 15 years ago that some sets moved very fast. Like I can remember being on ER and I mean the way, I mean the, I was like, I'm supposed to walk and do my crawl. I, could, I couldn't keep up whereas other sets were slower. It seemed like ER was almost like this circular motion that they had everybody kind of move they move the camera in and they're going around this one room where everyone's in these hospital beds and you're either an orderly or whatever and the the pace of that set was incredibly fast and everybody knew their role uh -huh. and they had pretty much designated regular extras and i was just like a fill-in uh -huh. and i didn't know how, which way was which whereas other ones it was had been established just very recently and right. you know you're sitting in a church pew crying or whatever and it was just a slower thing right so it's just interesting how certain sets and the dynamic of 
the scene or the sets or the show is just a faster pace. Right. Well, that I think has to do with has that set been established? If they shot 500 episodes in there, they don't have to figure out how to shoot that set every time anew. But there's like, you know, a kind of process. Whereas if it's a church that we have, we're shooting in for the first time, you do have to figure out these, all these things. Which lens does that way of the church look the best? Blah blah blah. It's all. Trial and error, whereas with the set that you've shot on again and again, the trial and error phase is over and you just kind of go right to the to the effect. Right. With the actors and pulling them aside, I find that very interesting because you're right, that people behave differently with other people around. And then was that something that you've heard other directors do? That they, they like to speak to the actor one on one without the handlers or whatever around because people will receive your message differently and they'll behave yeah. differently. I, I haven't talked to other directors about it, but I know that some productions asked me, do you want to meet them before so and so. So I know that it's, it must be a known thing out there that some directors want to do that. Um, and I'm sure that every director uses that time differently. Because I, in the beginning, was like, oh, I'm going to go through the script with them and we're going to analyze blah, 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 blah. By now, it's mostly we're talking about their pets or my pets or whatever, you know. It's really not even about that we that we sit over the material together, but really just about that we spend one moment together where neither of us are pretending and playing for a bigger audience, but it's really just us in the moment. Um, and you always go back to that initial connection um, that that you have. I think that's like the best spent twenty minutes of an entire shoot is kind of that alone time, oh, and no matter what you do. That's great. Yeah, playing for an audience. That's really that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah, I think it works the same in, in interviews as well. When there's less people around, right. you get a, a much different vibe than if you do a junket and people don't see that there's 10 people in the room. Right. And it, it is a different feeling. Yeah.